Good evening. Welcome to Larry Rinker Golf Live. Hope you're having a great week. I'm pleased to be joined this evening by Dr. David Wright, top 100 teacher and the founder and inventor of Right Balance. How you doing, Doc? I'm doing great, Larry. It's great to see you. Well, it's always great to have you on my show, whether it was in my Series XM days or now on Facebook Live. You have transformed the way we teach golf with Right Balance. I have been using your system now for almost five years. I've measured over 1,100 people using it. And to my disbelief, over 1,000 of those 1,100 people have measured upper core. Now, I'm kind of the upper core poster child because I wrote a book on it, which you helped with. I've got a lot of videos on my YouTube page about the upper core swing, but you're the one that came up with the models, the low, the mid, and the upper core swing. We're going to show some slides here in a minute and explain what that means, but I, I was so surprised, you know, when I found out I was upper core, standing up, coming out of posture, hips not very rotated, that I was like this part of the golf world swinging as an upper core player and what you have discovered and I've discovered through measuring is the vast majority of us are upper core. It's, it's pretty crazy. And yet the vast majority of golf instruction is trying to teach people to swing like a tour player. And I can't tell you how many upper core students I had one today that said, yeah, they put Adam Scott up. And that, that was who my model was, Adam Scott. And I shared with him, well, my model that a teacher put up for me in the 90s was David Toms. And I showed him David Toms and me. And if I showed you those two swings, you go, David Toms is mid to low core. He's not like you, Larry, he's an upper core player. Well, I think what you see too is, you know, as we've talked before, most of your tour winners, not all, well, Patrick Reed's upper core, right. but most are mid-core. Uh, you look at Hideki, mid-core. Uh, you know, Kepka, mid-core. Tiger uh, has been around the block a bit, but back to mid-core now. Right. So, you know, it's, I, you, I have some images of Tiger when he was swinging as a low-core player, but now he's back to mid-core. And by yeah. the way, I haven't told you this. I have moved to upper core, so I'm with you. What? I went, well, at my age. and 74. Getting those, uh, yeah, soon to be 75. I, I, that's just what fits my body at my age. It's much easier for me. As an athlete, I used a lot of body uh, pitched, uh, and I had tremendous external shoulder rotation. But I'm able to go to, with exercise, get right into my upper core, and, and I'm enjoying it. I really feel I have more power now than I had trying to get those hips through. So, yeah, I've moved up. Wow, that's amazing. Well, what you're talking about is this external rotation, and that's all I can rotate my right arm. I, you know, I can't lay it back like this. Uh, that's one of our tests that we do. But let's share a screen here, Doc, and... Larry Rinker Golf Live is on Thursday, 7.30 to 8 p.m. My new book is out, Larry Rinker, uh, The Journeyman. You can pick that up on my website, LarryRinker.com. There is my guest tonight, Dr. David Wright. He's been a top 100 teacher for quite some time. And we talked about Lori last time you're on and Tiger and somebody being out of balance, Doc, and this is kind of one of your new exercises, this express optimization. Once somebody's measured and we have their nine stance widths, this has been amazing. I've actually been doing this the last couple of weeks. I can't tell you how much better my back feels after I do these exercises. So talk a little bit about this. Well, this is a tensegrity exercise. Actually, it's, on, it's piggybacked on the Vice Institute, which is uh, Harvard Medical. Uh, it's a, a it's an isometric exercise that's held in two positions. Those two positions you see here, see here in each of these stance widths. And if you're in the proper grip size, uh, in the past, when somebody's measured, depending on the core region, we'd give them 
an alignment stick marked with what stance width they could play from. After this exercise, stance width is out the window, doesn't matter. You could play wow. from any stance width. <clears throat> but the exercise itself, uh, this, that's, that was the result of the exercise here. Uh, do you, ha you happen to have, this is the one, I don't think we can see it on the screen, but because our images are covering, but what you see in the first one is that the right shoulder, left shoulder there is lower than the left. Yeah, and right hip is higher. Oh, that's this one. This is Faldo. You're looking at. Oh, there it. you go. There you go. And you you're can looking see at an out of balance skeleton. You see his left hand turned in, his right hand straight. And then after he would do this exercise, now, now he would his spine and everything would be everything. Yeah, and that's huge in balance because the insertion point of the spine and pelvis, uh, the upper spine, cervical spine. Everything is level, and now we have a line we can use and rotate around before it's really torqued, and that's setting somebody up for injury. And what you said a moment ago in terms of your back doing better, that's a big reason why. One of the well, most- the exercise is really you roll your shoulders in like you're in a golf, but you roll in and you go hold it. three, yeah. you know, in and out two. And then you hold the club in your carrying angle with your hands and roll and roll these shoulders back and lean back. That's the, the picture. I'll bring it back up. But that's the picture. That's this picture now. And you can see how it's rolled back and you breathe in. You do two breaths. It, this, Doc, this takes two minutes to do. Absolutely. You do it in each of the nine stands with. Right. And it la it'll last if you did a little longer in the breathing, it'll last good 24 hours. It's not something that goes away immediately. So it, it sticks around. Well, for somebody that thinks we're talking Japanese right now and, and don't understand what we're talking about, what we're talking about is right balance. And right balance, uh, you've been around a long time, Doc, but from 2003 <laughs> to 2007, right. you did this study and these are the doctors you worked with, Dr. Frank Job. Wonderful guy, yeah. Dr. Job did the Tommy John surgery. He saved the uh, careers of thousands of athletes. We did the research in his lab at Sentinella Hospital. What's ironic, Doc, and it's in my new book, The Journeyman, when we had a mobile fitness center rolling on the tour in 1984, Dr. Job was our orthopedic and so I used to see him out on the on the road on the tour. So yeah, he's he been involved in sports medicine. Michael Melman, team physician for all the Los Angeles teams. He has championship rings with the Dodgers, Rams, Kings, and Lakers. He came up with the carrying angle. We're going to show that in a minute. Robert Watkins, he's also a consultant to right. the PGA Tour. Right. And uh, he just did Peyton Manning's neck surgery, Dwight Howard's back, his client list, Troy Aikman, Wayne Gretzky, Don Mattingly. Uh, I don't think we need to say a whole lot more. It's pretty much. Uh, These are all great guys, dear friends that I worked with. Uh, and then James Smith, physicist, your brother-in-law that right. helps with the algorithm. And then there you are, you have two doctorates and uh, you know, you have a medical background from University of Southern California. Yeah, I taught and, in the medical school there for four years. And then it's called Right Balance because you're the person that set up the research design, wrote the protocols, right. and ran the balance study for the duration, the four years of the project. And there it is, Right Balance, three swing models, low, mid, and upper core. And these are the nine core regions, one, two, three, low core, four, five, six, mid, seven, eight, nine, upper. We really could say, Doc, that the nine, the upper core, which I am, our hips are rotated the least at impact. And the one, the low core, they're the most. Dustin Johnson probably has his hips rotated the most of any player on tour today at impact. So really we could, we could kind of describe what that is and i believe doc a lot of top teachers would say your grip has to match how rotated your hips are at impact wouldn't you agree absolutely 
you know, you're going to have a much stronger grip uh, in the low core, much weaker in the upper, and the hybrid in the mid four, five, six, you're going to be pretty neutral. And then now there's me with my yardstick, and those are uh, my stance widths, and we, the algorithm you came up with, we get height, weight, shoulder width, sternum width, and shoe size. I mean, how'd you come up with those five things? Uh, well, the research in the lab, when we had a thousand sensors in each shoe, in those days, pretty, it's pretty automated. And now they had, to, they had 40 light sensors on the body. And it's pretty antiquated because that was what was around in the 80s when Frank Job did the original golf research. And so the, we had four biomedical techs, myself, Mickey Melman, Bob Watkins, and uh, Frank Job, and, we, and uh, Jim, my brother-in-law, Dr. Smith, was there to help set everything up. We had a launch monitor, we had a club head speed indicator, and all of these measurements. So over three years, we start to every day, I'm looking. We get two subjects a day because each subject took three hours. And we do one, su uh, one, one day a week. So I had six, seven days to go through all these data. And I began to look and began to find, wow, uh, we have uh, pros coming in, uh, some of my students. And we would be talking about how to find stance width because Shoulder width was is pretty the pretty much the gold standard. You got to be shoulder width. We found that's much too wide for some players and much too narrow for others. And we had a pretty good, uh, you know, over the years we had a decent number of low core. But I was, you know, I was the low core player. But as we began the research, we did a pilot study before we did the research. We had ten subjects in a pilot study. Then we started the research. But the, those stance with the core regions really, you know, looking 2003 to 2007, we only came out of that study with six core regions. Uh, we, those nine didn't come, evolve until further research, 2012, 13, 14. So it, it's, it emerged as we talked earlier. It's yes. emergent technology. It's, it's not, as I said, Traditional golf swings are reductionist, reductionistic, I should say, in that you look at the total swing and then we break it into pieces. Right balance started with a thousand sensors in each foot looking at balance. And out of that emerged where we are today. And where you are today is there's three swing models. And uh, if we share the screen again, if we really just focus on four things we talked about the grip so the low core player has the strongest grip number one and number four they have their hips the most rotated at impact well their pivot they pivot around their trail leg they move the most laterally right and rotate the least in the backswing and they have what we call the latest release where the trail arm straightens the latest the mid core player is really the hybrid in between the upper and the low core player, uh, but their pivot is a center pivot. So they're moving in between their feet. That it's basically your average tour player. The average tour player's hips are rotated 40 to 45 degrees at impact. And they have right. that midpoint release point. Uh, so pick your favorite tour player, Adam Scott, Ernie Els, uh, J Justin Rose, we could go on and on, couldn't we? Absolutely. And the upper core player, which I am and is the majority of us, we have the most neutral grip. We pivot around our front leg. Uh, we have the least lateral. That shows up. Your friend, Dr. Bob Giambetti, has shown that on Swing Catalyst, that an upper core player uses lateral motion the least, ground force. Uh, our hips are the least rotated at impact. But keep in mind, we made the shoes turn on the backswing and rotate it into a jump. And we release the earliest and stand up. So me standing up and the club going toward the ball, that's a vertical. It's Newton sixth grade physics, Doc. For every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. And then uh, this is that carrying angle that we measure. You have to be standing in your correct stance width because that changes by core region. 
And right. then that is what establishes our grip. Now, I think people would be very surprised and never heard anything. You have basically come up with a system that tells us what the angle should be in both hands on that golf club. That is amazing. Well, not you know, and that, Larry, the, you know, to me now, as I work more and more with students, setting that grip is absolutely critical. And, it, you know, we know that's your connection to the club. We've heard, all of us have heard that over the years. But the strength and weakness and the power spots are absolutely crucial. Uh, but that carrying angle that you're talking about, once that address, if you put that digital protractor you showed down the right arm and shaft, it shows up there face on. It shows up down the line, up the shaft and up the left arm if you take the right hand off. It shows up repeatedly throughout the golf swing. That is the angle of range of motion. No, it really does. And, and what, what I find interesting, I'll pull up V1 here, but you know, if we really look at this and look at some model swings, this is just me showing an upper core swing this last part where we swing the club past our bodies. But if I show you my low core model, Kathleen, and I show you Lori Rinker at Impact, who's our mid core model, uh, you're talking about this carrying angle, Doc. You know, how do we know what the posture should be? Well, I was here, oh, I hear on TV, oh, yes, that's great posture. You know, and this and that. Well, postures are different. Look at Kathleen, low core, ton of knee flex. Look at that, 149. Lori's, Not only that, but her spine angle matches that too. Right. And then Lori, her carrying angle is 158. So look at this. So, so first off, that carrying angle tells us a lot, doesn't it? Absolutely. And then here is the freak show. There's your low core player. There's your Dustin Johnson's. And then here's Lori Rinker, mid core, the pretty swing. There you are. There's your tour average swing. Yep. And then, well, I guess this swing can't work, you know, because the guy's not rotating. He's standing up and coming out of posture. I guess that's not going to work. That guy's never going to play the PGA Tour. <laughs> Because that doesn't look right. That, that, that's wrong, isn't it? Well, that's what your instructors of the 90s told you. They did. I can't remember. Yeah, you know, they kept saying, Rinker, turn that core, get that core more rotated. And the interesting thing is, is and I said earlier, we make this deep turn and we rotate into a jump. That's us getting, that's how we get our speed. And, but it's, it's just interesting looking at these things, if we really talk about four things, grip, how rotated are your hips, how do you pivot, and when when do you release the club with your trail arm in hand, those are four pretty simple things that I think a lot of people can get their arms around. Yes, uh, it is pretty simple, Larry. Very simple. We've so, actually been reduced. You know, once you have your nine stance widths, and you do that exercise, we eliminated stance with, now we can work on grip. Now we can work on posture. And right. the thing that isn't shown there is that, that every one of those players, you, for example, are gonna be on the balls of your feet. That's what is going to change. When you swing through, you cannot clear your hips. You are going to rise to be able to turn on through. Right. And when Kathleen, low core player, it's going to be over the center of the arches. Uh, and that's what allows her to clear her hips. If you go to the balls of your feet, try to stay there and turn through, you're going to feel what you just saw. You go to the center of the arches, you're able to turn through. Well, if we look at Kathleen at impact, where is her weight? Her weight is in her heel. Yep. I, don't, I don't think people can jump out of their heel, Doc. Nope. And that's why and if we Dr. look at speed, if we look at speed, who you believe is low core, I don't I do. think people yep. realize how rotated he is at impact and look where yep. his weight is. His yep. weight is in his heel. So there's there. So guess what ground force he's going to have the least. He's not going to have any vertical. And that's what Dr. Giambetti showed repeatedly in the research he did. So 
But it's interesting that that mid-core player, Doc, uses ground force equally. So they oh. use lateral, rotary, and verticals equally. Whereas me as an upper core, I don't use laterals much because I pivot around more around my left side of my body, front post. So my lateral movement is minimal, whereas that low core player, they're in their heel, so they're not using verticals much. So, but, but hey, if you're drinking the Kool-Aid, hey, everything needs to be more even and you're drinking this Kool-Aid, you need to swing like a mid-core player. I'll tell you what, Doc, I can't even imagine how many upper core players got coached out of their swings in the last 40 years. No, I'm sure. I know. Well, you know, Larry, the key is, the thing is, and I did this my first 20 years in the golf business, I taught what I did. Well, I think that's human nature. Yep. I think that's what we all do. We teach what we know. And if we understand how our swing works, you know, and that's why I loved about Bob Toski is he didn't really get into a lot of the stuff we talk about now, but he really taught us how to control the path with our arms. And he taught us how to control the face with their hands and said, hey, can you hit a low cut? Can you hit a low draw? And can you hit a high draw? He basically taught us how to hit shots. And right. it wasn't about all this stuff about the core and you know this train wreck that the big muscles control the little muscles. Peter, Pete Cohen uh, recently talked about, uh, he was on the uh, PGA uh, teaching summit. Did you happen to see him? I didn't that, see it. He had, I'll tell you, I enjoyed it so much because he talked about his career and how he would be looking at how to take care of the body. Now, he said I, he hurt his back trying to do things that he shouldn't have been trying to do. And uh, he wasn't real generous in his comments about PGA instruction, but he, he certainly understood uh, why he was where he was. Great teacher great teacher himself. And he would be in one of the first things he said, I don't know what I'm doing when I'm teaching. He's lying, but he is a, he was a very interesting to hear and talk about instruction in his day and why it's continuing to create issues in our day. Well, I, I think that is really interesting. And I think that we really, the whole thing is, and this is something that Bob Toski put in my new book, The Journeyman, but you know, standardizing teaching, we have to really work with the individual. We have to help the individual that's in front of us. And with so many people being upper core, I've come up with this just little checklist of, you know, if you think you're upper core, well, here's really your four keys. You got to have your hips square because if your hips are open, you're going to sway and not pivot correctly as an upper core player. So with the hip square, you can turn your trail hip or right hip as a right-handed golfer without swaying. And then so many people are trying to turn through the ball to get power and speed, and they come over the top of the plane. So we got to slot the club, and then we got to use our arms, hands, and wrists to swing the club past our bodies. And I was drinking this Kool-Aid looking at my swing that I needed to lag and rotate. And hang on and, there, it looks like. And huh? rotation, folks, is a face opener, not closer. And what's crazy, Doc, is as an upper core player and understanding now, I actually do the opposite. Yep. And Jack Nicholas said, said really three pretty cool things. Number one, he said, I tried to get my right hip out of the way on my backswing. Number two, he said, I tried to keep my back at the target. How long? As long as I could. And number three, he said, I tried to feel I was getting that club head started from the top of my swing. And that gave my arms room to swing. That's all upper core information. You know, and as I moved to upper core, one of the things, I start my swing now with my lower body, honestly. And well, back swing. Uh, yeah, backswing. And the fascinating thing, Larry, is I was always a trail loading. I was on that on that on my trail hip. Now when I know I know where I'm gonna hit the ball well because I'm right over the ball. All I have to do is is turn back through and it's the swing. We talked about that earlier. People I think have more of a hit in their swing. So what you talked about and letting the club slot 
I heard a, I heard that a lot in the 90s. You don't hear it much anymore. But you well, I, I talk about a free orbit of the club head. So right. what we really want is that club head to have a free orbit coming into the ball and past impact. To me, that means it's it's uninterrupted. And if you've got if you slot the club and get the club head on plane and understand how you release the club with your arms, hands, and wrist, you can have a free orbit going through and going past the ball. And I, I find really when I struggled, I didn't own my release. I didn't own I didn't own that part of the swing. And it's uh -huh. everything set up to deliver that club to the back of the ball. Right. And everything set up to have a free release and not be what tour players call stuck, which is when the body rotations get ahead of the arms and hands and we block it. Right. So uh, what Jack talked about is turning that right hip, keeping the back at the target, letting it go. You know, everybody thinks, oh, you're going to flip it. You're going to hook it. Well, I'm blocking it to kingdom come. I'm trying to stop that. Okay. <laughs> You know, if I start hooking a little too much, I get the left arm or turn a little more and, you know, that'll help. But, you know, my problem is over here to the right. I, I want to stop that, you know. Yeah, it's it's been a well over the years I've tried to play in every core region. I wanted to understand what my students were doing. So I went from low to mid. In fact, Bob G and Betty gave me a set of clubs with a mid core grip size. I worked with that for a while. Now I've gone to upper and I feel the freedom that, uh, you know, again, my age, I want to go have fun. I want to still have the same zip. I hit the ball quite, quite well. And I don't feel like I've suffered much in distance. I've actually moving to upper core. I've actually picked up distance. Well, that's interesting because I think a lot of people think that upper core swing is not as powerful as some or creates as much speed in the club head but oh. uh, you know i i think first off you got to swing the swing that god gave you we could really say right balance is helping people find their natural swings with a little tweak and that's really all we ever do with good players isn't it yeah it is yep it you is. know but it's interesting how you have come up with not only the setup keys for each core region but the matches of the pivot and the matches of, you know, all the parts of the swing that match up. You have created a semblance of order for golf instructors. And once we understand if somebody's upper, mid or low core, uh, we already know all the answers. And it's just a matter of getting our students to understand it. I gotta say the one thing most of my upper core players struggle with is disconnecting getting this to swing, you know, they're all connected. Everything's connected together. Uh, and they, they've got to get this independence of, of the arm swinging the club independently of the big muscles, the chest and the hips. And the chest and hips, in my world, Doc, as an upper core player, they move to support what my arms and hands and wrists do. They are not in the lead role. They're in the supporting role. Right. And I had a, an orthopedic come for a two-day golf school a few weeks ago. And he said, well, Larry, we consider the shoulders stabilizers. They stabilize. And so everything's about the big muscle stabilizing impact. That's why you want your weight and your front foot at impact. You know, so you can stabilize the blow and control the club face at impact and have some form of consistency of squaring that club. But, but what you've done with right balance, uh, I, I just feel blessed that I have it because I, I really feel I'm helping everybody find their, their golf swing and one that works, one that works quickly. One that I don't say, okay, we got to work on this for three or four months. Yeah, exactly. Well, you don't, and you should see results pretty quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, I'll then I, we, we were, you touched upon this earlier, but I'll tell you, before I got in the golf business, I owned chronic pain and headache centers with physicians. I was in the medical community. I owned the first ones here in Orange County, California in the 70s. Uh, so I understand a lot about pain. I mean, I treated pain for, I owned the centers until 2000s, and, uh, but I actively worked them through 1986. One of the things that's most rewarding for me as we're moving forward I'll have somebody come out, take a lesson, 
and they'll email me or text me before the next one, say, hey, my back is so much better. Uh, to me, that makes it all worthwhile. I mean, if they came out, they didn't improve, but their health is better. What right. we're looking at is longevity in golf. As we start the exercises you showed, that hands down. Uh, we did, we tested by uh, Dr. Watkins exercise in the biomechanics lab in 2000. Now we are more into it's a faster standing exercise, but it has a tremendous effect on the core, leveling the shoulders and the hips. So uh, there's so much to that and then reducing soft tissue pain. So you have two types of pain. You have central pain and you have peripheral pain. Central pain almost always involves peripheral. Central being spinal cord. Peripheral pain is in the muscles, muscle tissue. So if you have a spinal cord uh, lesion of some kind, you have a herniated disc, you're gonna get peripheral pain. So we, well, no matter what you do, and these exercises are quite innocuous, uh, no matter what you do, you, you're gonna have pain relief if you're able to get into it. Well, Doc, it's been great having you on the show. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank my sponsors, Tidelist, FootJoy, the Ritz-Carlton Golf Club, Orlando, and the Red Sky Golf Academy in Vail, Colorado. And uh, if you want a little more information on Right Balance, is rightbalance.com the correct website or is it rightbalancetechnology.com? No, it's, it's rightbalance.com. I should say we're in 15 countries now. And I also would say Google Right Balance on YouTube because there's so many videos out there, Doc, that you have put up and I've put up a lot myself to really help people understand more. And if you really want to understand upper, mid and low core and, and try and you know figure out what you are, uh, it's not too hard. How rotated are your hips? <laughs> Uh, at impact and you know that that's really kind of where it could start couldn't it absolutely absolutely Larry. Well, Doc, that's great thanks to for see coming you. on thanks everybody for listening until next week keep swinging